It's solved, it's solved, it's here, it's here. Ask him then. Touch me balls, touch me balls. No. Where are you going? He's going, he's gone, he's gone. Have you ever been surrounded by people in a busy town centre and you all of a sudden start getting cold sweats? Then you get really nervous as you feel your stomach start to ache. You then realise that there's nowhere to go. You're surrounded by people in a busy city. You suddenly get hit with the realisation that you have to think quickly. Then you ask yourself, do I obliterate my underwear? No, I can't. You act quickly in order to get the job done. Now you suck up your pride and pull your underwear down in front of everyone as they look on while you scream in horror and relief as you ass blast copious amounts of explosive diarrhea all over the sidewalk while passers-by scream in sheer terror at your arsehole as it vomits brown sick while it splashes against your cheeks and shoes. Then you start laughing like a maniac. This, my friends, is an analogy of what the Weinsteins did to Hellraiser Revelations. If they failed to make a Hellraiser movie quickly, then they would lose the rights to the franchise. So having a lack of concern for the fans of the Hellraiser movies, they decided that it would be a phenomenal idea to shit out a movie in just 11 days for the fans. Because they think this is what product you deserve. They think you deserve explosive diarrhea. They want you to buy explosive diarrhea while they point and laugh at you for buying it with your hard-earned cash. Let's see what worldly pleasures this entry in the Hellraiser franchise has to offer. Let's discuss Hellraiser Revelations. To truly understand how fathomable things proceeded to get over the years as the Weinsteins caused Hellraiser fans to repeat the excruciating process of eating our own eyeballs to shit them back out and put them back in place only to repeat the process every time we would look forward to a brand new entry into the Hellraiser franchise only to be slapped across our bare arse cheeks every time we'd pay cash on the property and then decided to suck it up and ask myself how did it become this cheap and uninspired? Hellraiser has a huge lore that isn't solely based on the Cenobites being front and centre stage. They are supposed to have such sights to show you, but instead after Hellraiser 2 the franchise became Americanized, and instead of spreading our arse cheeks and indulging us in pain and pleasure, they only deliver us with pain. But in order to truly understand just how complicated and horrendous Hellraiser revelations came to be, we have to go back to the beginning. How it started. In 1987, a new type of horror movie was released onto the big screen. That, like invincible horror icons Freddy, Jason and Michael and others, having centre stage in their respectable franchise, the Cenobites took a back seat which was incredibly fresh at the time. I won't go into too much detail as we can discuss this movie in the future, but this movie, Hellraiser the original, has real grit. It's incredibly well made and Hellraiser solidified Doug Bradley, who played the lead Cenobite, to some as a potential horror icon even though the Cenobites were only used as angels or demons to collect Frank for his horrific murderous acts to take him to this version of hell so they can torture the bastard for all eternity. This act also needs doing to people like Bill Cosby and the Weinsteins. Hellraiser 2 provided a familiar feel that opens the viewers up to the hellish labyrinth of the world of Hellraiser. Hellraiser 2 opened up a plethora of new ventures and gives us a peek into the other side. We see who rules hell and how Cenobites are created. But that is simply scratching the surface of a cinematic world that has the potential to be a huge successful horror franchise. But as the Hellraiser franchise seemed to be set up to be a heavy hitter with a huge supernatural world to be explored, they decided to take a step back. The beginning of the end. Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth, was where things started to get a little shady. The tone of the first two movies was flush down the shitter. The lead Cenobite, just a side character in Hellraiser and Hellraiser 2, looked incredible. He looked so impressive that instead of taking this deeper into the mysterious world of the Cenobites, they opted for making this character into a slasher icon. Like Freddy and Jason, the movie is an entertaining entry into the Hellraiser franchise, but as a Hellraiser movie, it was dumbed down and took the main 
demon focused, a pinhead, an intellect, a demon with purpose that enjoys indulging in slow, torturous acts of his victims in order to exploit extreme pain and pleasures that the human form has to offer. But Pinhead in this one was made into a thuggish horror icon that kills without reason. Hellraiser went Hollywood, and this was the beginning of the end for an intellectual horror franchise that should have more meaning to it rather than being dumped down into a mindless popcorn movie. I have a question for you. What happens to a horror franchise when they get incredibly lazy but want to come across as cool to a low budget audience? You already know, don't you, you lovely bastards? They go to space. Adventures in time and space. Hellraiser Bloodlines, like Hellraiser Hell on Earth, is a decent popcorn movie. But as a Hellraiser movie, it's outright abysmal. Hellraiser had so much potential and it had set up a lot of interesting things to be explored, but instead of dialing down and putting effort into continuing the direction and feel of Hellraiser 1 and 2, they went the other direction from a new endless world in Hellraiser 2, back to Earth in part 3, and then into space. Although it went in a different direction in order to try to please fans of other slasher icons, the movies were still somewhat entertaining. What went wrong? The fucking Weinsteins, that's what, that's what went wrong. The Hellraiser franchise was now dead. We received a conveyor belt of Hellraiser movies that were only made so that the Weinsteins could keep their rights to the franchise. These movies were scripts that wasn't Hellraiser films. They couldn't even be bothered to write a script for them. Instead, they opted to figure out how to fit Pinhead into these already written movies. And then they would have the fucking audacity to slap Hellraiser on the cover. If you're so desperate to keep the rights to a franchise, then put some fucking work into it, you lazy pieces of subhuman shit. The anger! Shut it, JJ! But in 2011, there seemed to be some light at the end of the tunnel. Our arseholes were being eased up on as a brand new entry to the franchise was released and it was written as a Hellraiser movie. This sounded promising. Would Hellraiser finally go back to its roots and be, in a, be an engaging, gritty world of pain and pleasure? That the franchise and fans damn well fucking deserve. Or were richer businessmen still continuing to take turns pegging Pinhead? Let's find out. Hellraiser Revelations. Fuck it. Nope. Fuck it. Why even bother? Start pegging. Stick it in my bum. Come on, I'll bend over, pull my pants down and just get right fucking on with it. What is life? What is life? We start with two idiots filming each other while they chat about getting their knobs gobbled by ladies of the night. We have no idea yet, but one of these tards is seen solving the puzzle box. Fuck knows why he's shirtless and surrounded by candles. It's just because Frank was in Hellraiser, I guess. But eh, got a question for you. Do you Rubik's Cube players do that? Do you take your clothes off and cover yourself in baby oil while you solve the box? Let me know in the comments below, you saucy bastards. Anyways, Bargain Bin Pinhead shows up, but you don't get a good look at him as the cameraman seems to have Parkinson's disease. It's shaky cam galore. I understand keeping Pinhead's look mysterious, but it's on the front cover of the fucking film. And in the very next scene, it simply cuts to him. And he looks freaking awful. Pinhead looks like a guy that walked into Spirit Halloween and bought a costume. Actually, fun fact, it, this costume that he's wearing actually was from an online costume place. I don't know where it were, but after watching a documentary, the writer of the film actually said that it was bought from a Halloween store. But let's be brutally honest, it looks like somebody's father bought it for the child from Spirit Halloween. That child that they don't like, it was their least favourite fucking child, it's that bad. You all also may have noticed that Doug Bradley is no longer in the role of Pinhead. Fun fact, this is due to them offering him almost jack and shit for the role. I believe they tried to give him $5,000 for it and he just laughed at them and told, it, told them to shove it where the sun does not shine. That's respect for you. That's the respect you get for playing this character for decades. Anyways, Doug politely declined. 
The gentlemen from earlier have been missing for quite some time, and are presumed dead. They left a grieving family and girlfriend, but guess what happens? One of the missing party dudes turns up in a state of shock and covered in the red stuff. Instead of rushing him to a hospital, they decide just cover him up and put him to sleep. Here, mate, have a good lay down, even though you, we haven't seen you for a long time and you're caked in blood. Come on, pal, lay down, have a good sleep. Go on, shagger. Fucking idiots. We then see a scene of bargaining bin pinhead with another Cenobite. <laughs> Look at this! <laughs> Look at him! What the fuck is this? You, you can't even be bothered to make an original Cenobite! Oh dear! <clears throat> now what happens at the boardroom meeting? I know old boy, we'll make a damaged 50% off version of Pinhead! <laughs> Fans will eat that shit right up! <laughs> Bloody spastics, yeah, spastics! Back to Nico and Steven, we find out that these fucking degenerates are creeps. Nico finds a romantic setting, the crapper, and takes a trip to Pleasure Town. Then Nico smashes her head in because, you know, because reasons. They then meet this smelly old bastard who randomly turns up and just, just like that, gives them the box. What's that, pal? It's the box. Do you want it? Yeah, mate. Oh, no problem. There you go, love. There you go, love. Siddy, Siddy. Fun facts, creator of Hellraiser Clive Barker even presented his distaste of the movie with a tweet stating, Hello good friends, I would like to put on record that this flick out there using the word Hellraiser is no fucking child of mine. I have nothing to do with this fucking thing. If they claim it's from the mind of Clive Barker, it's a lie. It's not even from my butthole. Let's take a quick break and dive into what Twitter thinks of Hellraiser Revelations. Hellraiser Revelations 2011. Right, I haven't got much to say on this one, other than it's utter shit. Avoid like the plague. You should replace most of the- you could replace most of the actors with blocks of wood, and the acting would be the same. Minus 10. No Doug Bradleys out of- out, out of fuck this shit I'm out. Alright, whatever that fucking says I guess. But apart from the terrible English at the end, I, I agree. I agree. Well, let's look at what this dickhead said. Who's this? The Movie Massacre Show. Huh. Alright, let's see what this fucking prick wrote. Watching hashtag Hellraiser at Revelations felt like I was trying to give birth to Pinhead out of my tight little arsehole. Okay. Oh, I had enough for Twitter. Fuck it. Come on, let's carry on. Things get real weird as Nico takes his shirt off and he proceeds to ask his buddy to film him. Kinda saucy. He solves the puzzle box it seems that any fucker can do it after part 3. You just give him it and they just do a circle with their thumb and you've solved this puzzle box that's apparently really fucking difficult to solve. But whatever, the script requires it I guess. Anyways, your favourite bargain bin Pinhead turns up. I'll just call him Dickhead instead of Pinhead from now on. Anyway, this happens. What the fuck are you? What do you want? Box. Hey, take it. It's yours. Just get the fuck out of here. No. Isn't that award winning? Isn't that award winning dialogue? Play it again just for giggles. Who the fuck are you? What do you want? Duck box. Hey, take it. It's yours. Just get the fuck out of here. No. Dear fucking me. Now I need to pee. One moment. Oh, lovely. Oh, lovely. That's better than watching that fucking film. Oh, beautiful. This is where they lazily take the story from the original movie. Nico was taken by Dickhead, Bargain Bin Pinhead, but in order to bring Nico back to life, Steven must bring Nico human bodies so he can eat them and become a real boy, just like Pinocchio. Anyway, Nico's Mrs. Emma gets her hands on the puzzle box and for some reason she has an orgasm and then decides to take some soup to her brother, Stephen. Stephen is so turned on by having soup that he starts touching his sister. Bleeding, eh, lad? What are you doing? What are you doing? That's gross. He even goes after a chicken breast. That's your sister, mate. Calm down, calm down. Go for a wank. But yeah, yeah, weirdness. Yeah, let's forget that. As you've already figured, this movie is a nuclear shit fest. It's like one of those dumps that blasts out like a flock of sparrows, flying out in every direction. Pinhead is being pegged into oblivion. This had potential as it was written to be a Hellraiser movie unlike most of its sequels. I'm all for giving other actors a shot at playing Pinhead, but the character and makeup look like a bleached arsehole. The gore looks like they found a couple of used tampons and then just threw them at a wall. Although the actors act like they're at an in-laws family gathering, none of them want to be there. They just want to get the fuck out as soon as possible. Let's talk about the writer Gary J. Tunnicliffe, who has a depth of knowledge and love for the Hellraiser franchise. 
I feel like Gary represents us, the fans. He's worked on every Hellraiser movie from Hellraiser 3 Hell on Earth to the latest instalment as of this episode, Hellraiser Judgment. From doing the makeup effects to writing and directing, Gary himself knew that the sequels were terrible and he rightfully wanted to have a crack at making a Hellraiser movie. And I can't blame him for that. As a fan himself, he knew what the franchise needed. He wants to put love back into it. Baby making love, not the whore kind. He received that phone call asking if he could finally do that movie. But unfortunately, he was tired of working on Scream 4. He may come across as a window licker for this, but he wanted to finish up and write and direct the new Hellraiser movie. But that's a testament to how much he cares about the Hellraiser franchise. He couldn't get out of Scream 4, so he wrote the script for it instead. This script took the franchise back to its roots, but the studio and others interfered and changed it and it was extremely disappointing. This film was rushed and filmed in 11 days. It was rushed simply because they'd lose the rights to the license if they didn't make another movie. These videos that I do take longer than it made them to make a fucking Hellraiser film. Ugh. Gary eventually managed to sink his teeth into the world of Hell Hellraiser with Hellraiser Judgment, which had an extremely low budget, but it was a good film that had a Hellraiser feel to it. And you could tell that it was made with sexy love. Beautiful, Mr. Lover Lover Love. They called me Mr. Lover Lover. Mm. Anyway, after tonguing his sister and feeling some chicken breasts, Stephen's now feeling better and enters the room like a boss. Struts in with a shotgun and reveals himself to be Nico wearing Stephen's skin. <laughs> Wait a damn minute, so Nico tongued Steven's sister while wearing Steven's skin? That shit's messed up, mate, that's messed up. I hear you ask yourself, what was Nico's motive? Well, apparently Nico and Steven's family are banging each other. They're just having big orgies with each other, left, right and centre. And he's also bored alive, so he decides to kill everyone. As you do when you're bored, I guess. Anyway, Steven, who is now skinless, solves a puzzle box and becomes the 50% off pinhead from earlier. Exciting stuff, isn't it? If you said yes to that, then shame on you, shame on you. Shit, you... Nah, nah, get out, go, get out, go. I'm only kidding, keep watching, because I need the watch retention. Anyway, this movie is like that excitement of finding out that your parents have bought you something nice, only to find out that they've got you a backstage pass to Jim will fix it. Or the Cosby Show. For my American friends, just Google Jim will fix it or Jimmy Savile and you'll find out how much of a fucking pedophile he is. The Cenobites then arrive for Nico as the box has been solved. Again, you know, just as it is, easy, fucking easy peasy. And they take what they came for. They take Nico. But Nico's dad blasts him dead before they manage to take him to the deep depths of this universe's hell. Nico luckily managed to avoid eternal torture. So, dickhead being the thug that he is, decides to take Nico's mum instead. <laughs> you will never guess in a million years what these cheeky fuckers had the audacity to do next. Right? Guess what they did? These fuckers, they had the damn nerve to leave sequel bait. Sequel bait for this shit. Come on, come, come on. What is the sequel bait? We see Emma reach out to try to solve the puzzle box. And then the best part of this movie happens. It fucking finishes. And you know she's gonna solve it because any fucking, any spastic can do it. Any retail window liquor, someone that eats orange crayons so they think they can get the fix of vitamin C. Anybody can solve it. It's a fucking bird with no hat. Birds don't have hands. They have little sweet little posy wozzies. They could solve it with the posy wozzies. It's that fucking easy and bird centibikes will come out. And they'll fight bird centibikes. They'll all get passed on to rabbits. Little rabbits will solve it with the little posy wozzies and rabbit centibikes will come out. Fucking, that'd be better than this fucking film. Better than this film, I'm telling you right now. Here's a fun fact that you already know. It's shit. Also, I don't mean to insult your intelligence, as anyone would pick up on this, but the two families of, are the Cravens and the Bradleys. You know, you should already know the gentleman that these are references to. Final thoughts. Hellraiser Revelations is a product of greed. Greed that comes with no understanding or love for the franchise that the Weinsteins own. 
This end result is in no way, shape or form the fault of the cast and crew involved. This is just another victim of a Weinstein. The way I see it is, if you want to hold on to a property in order to profit from it, then put some fucking effort into it. There's no point of keeping a license just to keep the license. With Hellraiser there's a there, with Hellraiser there's money to be made. Make a Hellraiser movie with love. Make it for the fans. Did we damn well fucking deserve it? Luckily for us though, after a legal battle in 2020, the Hellraiser creator himself, Clive Barker, I'm gonna kiss you, I fucking tell you. If I see you at a con, I'm just gonna lunge over the table and snog you. Anyway, he finally reclaimed the rights back and we finally have something that we that we deserve. We're getting a Hellraiser TV series. I feel that this is the right direction for the franchise as the world is huge and the TV series gives it plenty of room to be explored. And above all else, this has been gonna be made with love and hopefully the fans will get something incredibly special. And we got an announcement to make. Guess what's next? Some of you have been requesting Neil Brain movies. Well, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get this. My name is Cade. I have an identical twin brother, Kale. Then one day it all changed. There was a bright light in the sky and time stood still. We were both selected. The pure majesty of nature. Programmable virtual reality. The corrupt version. A limitless digital universe, connecting all shared virtual reality. Digital tribes. I miss what I never knew. I'll take you, you out to dinner. Leave me alone. Let's, I have a boyfriend. Let's have get a, out of my face. Let's have a Leave drink. Let's have a drink. Leave me alone. Let's have I a have drink. a boyfriend. I'll meet get you back here face. at 8 o'clock. I miss my brother. I'm with you. Programmable matter. Kuz's biological mutant warfare plans must be stopped. Who am I? What am I? It's a killer with unidentifiable DNA? In AI, fright and interest are not far from each other. Things can become real in your mind. I trust you completely. And you believe things you wouldn't ordinarily believe. Who's there? Justice is served. This is where we bring you all to rot and die. Kate, I will love you for all eternity. We will live in a virtual metaverse, a virtual universe, living in our own world every day. Everyone has the right to love, and peace. I'll be right here. Oh, we 
we're fucking good to you. We are good to you, aren't we? It's because we love you. Are you one of the loyal, unfortunate sods that have seen Hellraiser Abomination? <coughs> Hellraiser Revelations. What did you think? Let me know in the comment section. I really do love chatting with all of you. And to everyone that joined in in the discussion and left a comment in the last video, thank you very much. Big shout out to all of you. And yeah, I'm an asshole, but I do love and appreciate you. I really do. And if you're new to this channel, please consider subscribing. I join you in our damn cult, Sidi. And just before we go, I would like to say that I was going to take screenshots of everybody's comments and put you on the screen so everybody could see you. But as you can see, I got ill and that is actually my urine and I just didn't have the energy, but I promise I will do it in a future video. Um, anyway, thank you very much. I'm out.